Good morning and welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, this webinar on Voyage Charters, um, which is the final webinar in our Voyage Charter series. Uh, before we move on to a cargo claims series uh, in the spring of 2022. I'm Alex Davey, uh, I'm a partner in the shipping team and I'm head of litigation at Burkitt's and I'm joined by Pamela Dunning who is a senior associate in, in the shipping team. So for those who have not seen these webinars before or who don't know Burkitt's, uh, this slide has a few stats uh, just to introduce the firm and hopefully give some idea about our size, scope, and ambition both for our clients and for those who may want to join us. And then this is the shipping and international trade team of which Pamela and I are both a part uh, and some of the nice things people have said. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, these webinars are available and you may already know this on uh, YouTube. Uh, they're also available on Youku and uh, Tencent, I gather. So series one is on UQ and series two is on Tencent and being loaded, and series one is being loaded on Tencent as well. They're also available on U YouTube. So uh, you can watch them again or over and over again if you really want to. So today we are covering some more topics related to bills of lading following on from series one. Um, so we'll start with a bit of a recap. Um, and then what we wanted to do particularly is tie up some, some other uh, points on bills of lading. Uh, so to look at the money side in terms of freight payable under the voyage charter, and then what to do if um, there are problems in recovering that freight, what options might be available, and particularly looking at liens and also interception of bill of lading freight. Then uh, we will tie up some loose ends, as I said, in relation to incorporation of other terms and clauses paramount um, before we finish with a Q&A. So let me start with this brief introduction and really a reminder that we did a series in series one. We did a webinar on bills of lading and time charters and, and which included voice charters, actually. Um, and so please, please do, if you haven't already seen it, please do have a look at that webinar, which introduced uh, this whole topic. Uh, in particular, we, we covered what are bills of lading, uh, what are they for and how are they used? We looked at the three functions of a bill of lading in terms of receipt for the goods, um, evidence of the contract of carriage and where it's a charter party bill of lading, the how you incorporate a, a, a charter party terms. And we also looked at the use of a bill of lading as a document of title. Uh, and then finally finished off with identifying the parties to a bill of lading and, and, and title to sue. And for those who have seen this, uh, seen that um, uh, webinar, this is a diagram that I introduced to try to um, put bills of lading and charters into context because whenever you look at a, a time charter or a voyage charter or a bill of lading you, you it's, it's often important to think of the context of the situation and all the other contracts that could be in play so if i could briefly explain this again for those who haven't seen it what we have here in this example and it is simply an example um, is a is a seller um, selling goods to a buyer and then the buyer selling goods to a receiver. Now, the buyer in these circumstances has bought the goods free on board and sold the goods at cost insurance freight. So it is the buyer uh, who is organizing the carriage of this cargo from A to B. In order to organize the carriage, uh, we've got a head owner uh, who has time chartered their ship to a charterer, who has trip time chartered their ship to a subcharterer. And then the subcharter has voyage chartered the ship to the buyer, who is the sub sub charterer in this case. So we've got all these charters uh, and we've got these sale contracts. And then in addition to all of that, we then have the bill of lading. So the bill of lading has been issued as a receipt to the shipper, the seller, and represents evidence of a contract of carriage um, between the shipper and the, who I've called the carrier here in dotted in the dotted box. And the reason for that is that the um, you have to identify who the carrier is. 
Uh, and if it's an owner's bill of lading, uh, then the carrier is the head owner, but it could, all, of course, be a charterer's bill of lading or indeed a subcharterer's bill of lading. Um, and we looked at that in, in the first webinar. So if it is a, a bill of lading signed for and on behalf of the master, and then it's likely to be an owner's bill of lading and the owner will be the, the carrier here. And then we looked at um, how this bill then um, is used. So we trans the shipper then transferred the bill to the buyer in return for some money. In this case, it was a letter of credit. And then the buyer transferred the bill of lading to the receiver, again, in return for a letter of credit. Uh, and that meant that the receiver in, th in legal theory can then present the bill of lading at the discharge port uh, to whoever the carrier is uh, and ask for delivery of the goods. And indeed, that represents a, a, that, that contract of carriage. Uh, and if the goods are short uh, or damaged, um, it's a contract on which the receiver can sue. Uh, so, so that's the use of that bill of lading. Uh, we talked about it as being the keys to the warehouse, enabling the receiver to, to get to the goods. So that really puts um, bills of lading, voice charters and other charters uh, into context. Of course, what I wanted to make it clear is that that is just a, an example um, dreamt up in my head. Um, it could be much simpler. Um, you know, you simply could have a, a, an owner a voyage chartering to a charterer. And indeed, in fact, the charterer could even be the shipper or, or the receiver. And then, um, of course, you could have a much simpler charter party chain as well, or, or indeed sometimes a more complicated charter party chain. We'll look at that uh, again in a bit more detail when we come on to Leon's. Um, but before we do so, so what we're ne next going to look at is um, the payment of freight. Um, and then after that, we can then look at um, ways to deal with the situation if freight is not paid or monies are not paid. But before we worry about if they're not paid, let's let's have a look at what does need to be paid and, and how you determine it and when. So I will now hand over to Pamela. Thank you, Alex. Um, we thought it would be useful um, to, to think about what what freight is. Um, um, and we're talking here, of course, in the context of a charter party rather than a bill of lading. Um, and we're going to look at how it's usually calculated. Now, freight is simply the sum that is payable for the carriage of a cargo. It's the remuneration. Um, and a ship owner will need to take into account various factors when considering an appropriate rate of freight to negotiate and charge, um, including the expenses likely to be incurred over the course of the voyage, including bunkers and port costs. Um, together with amounts that go towards the maintenance cost of the vessel and also allows an element of profit to be earned. So generally, and subject to the particular terms of any contract of carriage, freight is earned by the carriage and arrival of the goods at the port of destination. Now, under common law principles, if an owner does not carry the goods to the port contracted for, uh, he does not earn freight. Um, and if only part of the cargo is carried, he is not entitled to recover freight for the part not carried. And frequently, however, the terms of the charter party will modify some of those common law rules and they'll often make um, specific and, and express provision for matters such as when freight is earned and when it becomes payable, um, which you do need to bear in mind may be two different things. Um, and we'll look at this in a minute. Um, looking first at how freight is calculated, usually this will be in one of two ways. Um, the first one is that it may be expressed simply as a lump sum figure. Um, and secondly, it may be calculated by reference to the weight or volume of the goods that are shipped. Now, a lump sum is just that. It's a, it's a one-off amount that is not connected to the quantity of cargo loaded. So that lump sum freight mean, re, re, will remain payable um, even if part or, or the whole of the cargo is lost and does not arrive at the discharge port. Um, and, a, and indeed, an owner is also entitled to be paid the full freight even if no cargo is shipped in the first place. Now, in circumstances where any short shipment or, or loss arises from an actionable fault of the owner, um, a charter may, of course, have a claim for damages, but that does not of itself uh, avoid the freight being payable. So in the second situation, freight may be expressed by reference to 
um, a cargo quantity uh, to the weight of the cargo. Um, and the freight payable by reference to cargo quantities may have particular stipulations about whether this is on an intake quantity um, or, or on the quantity discharged. And this may matter because, for example, if, if some of the cargo is lost en route, the two quantities may be different and this will affect the calculation of the freight. Um, so it's important to uh, check the exact wording of the charter party in, in such a case. Um, and I've put an example on the slide there uh, of such a case, the Matula, where freight was computed on intake quantity um, as per the terms of the charter. And there was no provision for adjusting or remeasuring the cargo at, at the discharge port. So the, the amount of freight was fixed at loading. Um, so the full freight became payable, despite in this case, the loss of a considerable quantity of the cargo when the vessel stranded during the voyage. Now, we'll come on to look at when freight is earned by the owner, when it's payable um, by the charterer. But it's also worth stopping at this point to consider um, first the rule against um, set off against freight, which is well recognised by the courts and it's invariably upheld. Now, the rule is that a party who is liable um, for freight cannot withhold that sum or defend a claim to the freight by trying to set off or counterclaim for other sums or damages um, to which it uh, uh, alleges it is entitled. Um, and I've put uh, the, the quote from the, uh, the Aries case on there, um, and that's the case in which the, the court noted that this was a very long established um, rule um, uh, and the nature of the rights to freight is, is a special obligation to which the usual rules of equitable and, and common law set off do not apply. So there may be very limited exceptions to this where the parties have specifically agreed certain deductions in the charter party um, and common examples are, are commissions or, or where cash is advanced to the master for disbursement. But as I say, they tend to be very limited and express. So, for example, where goods may have been lost due to some fault on the part of the owner uh, and a charter has a claim in damages, the charter cannot use the existence of that claim as a reason to withhold or settle freight. Um, and I've put another example on the slide here, the case of the Elena. Um, and in this case, the ship was chartered for a lump sum on the basis of the availability of a certain floor space in the vessel to carry livestock. Now, at the load port, the, the veterinary surgeon responsible for overseeing the loading of the animals wasn't satisfied with the ventilation available, and he therefore restricted the loading to a much, much smaller floor space. Um, so as a result, the charters were unable to load the quantity of livestock they intended to, and they purported to deduct their loss from the freight payable. So the court held that the ship owner was entitled to freight in full without deduction, even though the breach by the owner regarding the floor space was apparent before loading. So whilst the charters may have had a cross claim for damages, this was a claim they had to pursue in its own right. Uh, and not by way of set off against freight. So, so when is freight earned? Although under the common law freight, uh, under the common law, freight has traditionally been earned upon delivery. Um, the parties um, to a charter often stipulate that it's earned at an earlier time. Now, earned means the obligation um, to pay freight as accrued, um, but it doesn't necessarily um, follow that it becomes payable at the same time. Um, and there are some charters that, that make this clear. For, for example, um, the Gencon 1994 form provides that freight is to be paid upon shipment, um, but it shall be deemed earned and non-returnable whether the vessel or cargo is, is lost or not lost. So some of the charge parties also make it clear when freight is to be paid, um, as the example of the Gencon 1999 form that I've just mentioned has shown. Um, and another example is the Asper Tank Boy um, Charter, uh, which provides at Clause 2 um, of Part 2 that payment of freight shall be made by the charter without discount upon delivery of the cargo at destination. So it makes it clear when the freight is actually to be paid. So if there's no express provision within the charter party uh, as to when freight is payable, then the fallback position is that it's likely to be payable on delivery. 
Um, but it's worth looking at the precise words in the event of any incident, um, as it may make a difference to the remedies available for non-payment. So if, if freight is payable upon delivery, um, then if cargo receivers are, are ready and, and willing and able to, to pay the freight, then an owner must commence discharge, even though he might wish to exercise a lien, which Alex is going to come and talk about in a moment. If the receivers are not prepared to pay freight, then an owner would be entitled in those circumstances to exercise a lien. However, where freight is payable after delivery or after completion of discharge, an owner is actually unlikely ever to be able to exercise a, a lien um, since it would no, have no right to claim the freight until after it delivered the goods. And uh, at that stage, it has lost possession of the goods. Um, we're going to come on to look at issues about whether other parties may be liable to pay freight, and Alex will discuss this a bit. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to him now um, as he's going to explain a little bit more about liens. Thank you, Pamela. So um, Pamela's just told you how, when, when is, when is, um, when is freight due and how much is due? Um, but the question is, what happens if that or any other sum for that matter is not paid? What are the options? And obviously, you know, one can sue and go to arbitration or court and try to enforce that judgment. Um, but are there any self-help remedies? And, and one classic uh, that many will have heard of perhaps is a lien. Um, but what exactly is a lien? And confusingly, the word lien is used in three completely different ways, um, which you may or may not be have come across. Uh, and let me explain. Um, the first is a maritime lien. The second is possessory liens. Uh, and the third is a lien on sub freight or sub hire. Um, and as I say, these are actually completely different things. So uh, the word lien is being used in three completely different ways. Um, so let me explain. The first is a maritime lien, which is a category of claim. So it's a type of claim allowing uh, the claimant to bring a claim against the ship, uh, irrespective of who owns that ship. Uh, and in under English law, that's uh, for salvage, crew wages, wages and disbursements of the master and damage done by a ship. So that type of claim uh, is a maritime lien. Then we have possessory liens, which is possibly what we were all, may, many of you are thinking about, which is the threat. It's the right to retain possession or control of goods or documents uh, until money is paid. So in a sense, uh, in, in basic terms, I'm not going to discharge that cargo. I'm going to close hatches until you pay me. So that's the possessory lien. And then something actually completely different, which is a right to go after um, sub hire or sub freight, ask someone else to pay you. Um, and uh, it is an equitable assignment of the right. But but I will come on and explain that in, in more detail uh, shortly. Um, but again, something something quite different. So let's look, first of all, at uh, possessory liens. So. A, a lien, a possessory lien can exist at English common law and, and possibly in local jurisdictions. So anywhere in the world, you may find that there is some, something similar in the in the local law. Um, uh, but often uh, that sort of lien is, is often quite limited and it's much more common to rely on and see contractual clauses in charters and bills of lading referring in, to, to, in, in some detail uh, or not to a lien over cargo for all sums due. Um, some will be worded uh, in more in more detail than that. Um, and the effect, as I've just said, is that you are retaining possession, you're withholding possession or control of the cargo, and you're withholding it from the lawful owner of that cargo and or the person entitled to immediate possession. And therefore, in order to be able to exercise that lien, you need a contractual right against the lawful owner of that cargo or the person entitled to immediate possession. So let me just explain why that then potentially causes a problem. Let's imagine we have a voyage charter here. The charter hasn't paid the head owner. The head owner wants to exercise a lien. The voyage charter contains a lien over cargo for all sums due. Um, so there's no problem with that. The problem is, that in many cases, 
the charter is not the owner of the goods, nor the person entitled to immediate possession. When I say the person entitled to immediate possession, I'm talking about somebody who has the right uh, to call for um, delivery of the cargo under a bill of lading. They're not necessarily the lawful owner, um, so the, the, either party. But the problem is, as I say, that often the charter is not that person. Now, if the head owner wants to exercise a lien in these circumstances, what they're going to have to do is find a lien in the bill of lading. Uh, now, there may be a lien in the bill of lading, um, because if you're incorporating voyage charter terms, uh, the likelihood is that that will incorporate the, the, the lien clauses. Um, but bear in mind that if you're exercising this right in a foreign jurisdiction in somewhere, somewhere else in the world, and obviously a lot of cargoes moved to many places in the world, and English, England is only a small place, um, so the likelihood is this is happening somewhere else in the world. And, and, and if the receiver is going to their local court and saying, I've paid, this is my cargo, I'm entitled to it, that there's a very good chance that the local court will um, order delivery of that cargo. So immediately there is a potential tension between the lien in the voyage charter uh, and potentially in the bill of lading and actually the ability to exercise um, that lien. The lien must be for sums due and in order to exercise the right there must be a notice and there must be continuous possession or control. The notice must provide the cargo owner with sufficient materials to calculate the correct sum to pay. So it doesn't actually have to have a number in it, provided that the cargo owner can calculate the number. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter if the sum demanded is greater than the amount subsequently found to be due, uh, provided that obviously there was a sum that was found to be due. Um, it should be exercised at the discharge port, so not midway uh, on the voyage, um, but at the discharge port. But there is some law to suggest that if this isn't possible in the local jurisdiction for, for whatever reason, then sailing as close as possible to the discharge port, but remaining in international waters is acceptable. Now, a wrongful lien, the wrongful exercise of a lien, is a breach of contract almost certainly, um, and or in English law, at least, a tort of wrongful interference with goods. Um, so, you know, potentially a damages claim. Um, obviously, you know, if we go back uh, to this slide, um, you know, the receiver will could potentially claim damages under the bill of lading and say, I'm entitled to the goods and you haven't delivered them to me. Uh, so a potential breach of contract. So in summary, you know, there's plenty of complexity in relation to liens and the exercise of liens, possessory liens, um, but we have an expression possession is nine tenths of the law, and most most uh, liens are resolved by negotiation. You know, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of running around, um, but normally something happens, somebody provides some some money, or there is a res resolution. But not in all cases, and there are there is case law where where things have um, got pretty messy. Definitely something. Uh, for the in the armory of, of somebody trying to recover money. Now, the second type of lien I was going to talk about was the lien on uh, sub freight or sub hire, which, as I explained, is something completely different. And the best way to explain it is to give an example. So here we have a, a head owner who's chartered to a charter who's sub chartered. The head the head charter is a time charter. It includes in the terms of the charter a lien on sub freight. They're owed, I've just said, $100,000, and the charter is owned a million dollars in freight from the sub charterer. Now, what the head owner is going to do is say, send a notice to the sub charterer and say, I have a lien on sub freight, I'm owed $100,000, please pay me instead of the charterer. And that is a valid notice and it is uh, enforceable. Um, and now there's been there is a bit of case law in relation to liens on sub freight. Actually, for a long time, the courts have grappled with exactly what this is. There was a bit of debate as to what exactly this right was, and whether it was some sort of a, a assignment or some sort of stoppage in transit right. Um, but actually quite recently uh, the court concluded that it was an equitable charge and or assignment of sub freight or sub hire. So 
effectively what the charter is doing in the when entering into the time charter is saying um, I am giving you an assignment of my rights to freight under my subcharter uh, if you're owed money from me right, so an equitable assignment and that was just uh, concluded in the uh, in the western Moscow now so that's the sort of simple example of what a, a notice a notice of lien on subfreight is of course there are some complications so let me run through those with you so the first question here is um here we have a time charter includes a lien on subfreight um but in this case actually the subcharter is a, another time charter a trip time charter but it's a time charter so the subcharter owes the charter a higher of $150,000 and the, and the head owner owes um, is owed $100,000. So the head owner uh, issues a notice of lien on sub hire, bearing in mind the terms actually say a lien on sub freight. Does that matter? Now, I've got a little poll here, so um, uh, you can tell me what you think the answer is. Uh, is it yes or no? Does a lien on sub freight include a lien on sub hire? So we've got 66% said uh, no, 34% uh, yes. So um, in the early 1980s, uh, the uh, yeses would be correct, but unfortunately they were overruled by the noes. So um, funnily enough, it was the same ship, um, two very distinguished judges. Uh, in the Cebu number one, uh, Mr. Justice Lloyd said um, that freight included hire. And there was no, you didn't need to distinguish between the two things. Uh, but uh, Mr. Justice Stein in the CB number two, a few years later, said, no, 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 there's there's a big difference between hire and freight. Um, they are a time charter is a contract for services of a ship and crew. A voyage charter is a contract of carriage. Freight covers everything. Hire is just one element of, of payment. Therefore, you can't com compare the two. They're not the same. Uh, and the Bulk Chile, uh, the Court of Appeal in the Bulk Chile confirmed all of that uh, fairly recently. So, uh, and, and you will now in fact find that most time charters include a lien on sub freight and sub hire in order to uh, deal with that issue. So the next question is, what about sub sub freight or sub sub hire? So here, here, here we have a, a slightly longer chain, um, a time charter, which includes liens on sub freight and sub hire. A sub time or voyage chart doesn't really matter uh, with a lien on sub freight or sub hire. And then a sub voyage charter at the bottom. And in this case, the head owner is writing, I mean, to be honest, the head owner would probably write to the sub charter and the sub sub charterer, but they're going after the sub sub charterer, a lien on sub sub freight. Can they do that? Uh, yes or no answer and we got another poll okay very good well we had 79 percent you know we're definitely a favorite here um and uh on this occasion uh, the yeses are correct so uh, again something that was confirmed recently in the western moscow uh, a lien on sub freight includes a lien on sub sub freight or sub sub hire so and, and, and indeed sub 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 if there were more charters so so that's at least clear so some practical tips um, if you are the party receiving a notice and have already paid there should be no problem at all um, a lien on uh, these these this lien notice only works if someone hasn't already paid however if you receive a notice and haven't paid you must be really really careful to avoid the risk of double payment and I often advise people to you know make sure they told their accounts teams and everybody involved because you know the last thing you want is to is to receive a notice and uh, 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 and um agree that you're not going to pay and then find the accounts team have, have sent the money through anyway because they were asked to uh, you know some days ago and they've diarized it so 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 take a lot of care there and then if you are that party receiving one of these notices consider off consider offering to place the money into escrow for, for the other parties to argue over you don't want to, if possible get involved in that argument um, and, and if you can put the money in escrow, they, they can argue over it. Now, when we talk about liens on sub hire and sub freight, um, we should also talk about intercepting bill of lading freight. And it's it's a very, very similar 
um, idea, but it's actually something completely different. Um, uh, and, and, and but you will often find the two happen at the same time. So let me explain. Um, we have here a, 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 a head owner who is time chartered to a charterer, who is voyage chartered to a sub charterer. The bill of lading incorporates the terms of the voyage charter, and that will include the payment of freight clauses. So what? And since this is evidence of a contract of carriage, you actually have a contract between the head owner and the lawful holder of the bill of lading, could be the shipper or the receiver, the lawful holder of the bill of lading. Um, and what this means is actually the head owner has a contractual right to the freight under that bill of lading. So, the, and the head owner, now that, that bill of lading might, because it incorporates the terms of the voyage charter and the voyage charter says, this is the amount of freight and this is where it should be paid. Most of the time, that is what the, the bill of lading holders should do. That's where they should pay the freight. But the owners can change those instructions. And they can say, that might be what the voyage charter said, but now I'm now actually I instruct you to pay me instead. And so what they're doing is intercepting um, bill of lading freight. Uh, again, uh, just with a lien on sub freight, it has to be done before payment is made. Um, uh, but it can be um, for the whole amount, the whole amount of the freight. And then the owners would then have to work out how to 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 um, if they're not owed all of that money, uh, then to account for the parties down the charter party chain. And there's a bit of debate in, in law still about how that exactly would be done. So some, not a lien, uh, not an equitable assignment. Uh, this is simply a right to intercept bill of lading freight. Again, if you receive a demand to pay freight to owners, don't ignore it because you may have to pay twice. It's exactly what happened in the bulk Chile. Um, in the bulk Chile, there were uh, liens on sub freight and an interception of bill of lading freight. The sub sub charterer ignored all of that. The sub sub charterer was the bill of lading holder. They ignored all of that. Uh, they paid um, uh, the party up the chain and they and the court required them to pay again. So again, offer to put the money into escrow, leave others to fight over it. Now, one might think one way around this is to is to refuse to issue a, 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 for the owners um, to refuse to issue a freight prepaid bill of lading because if it's freight prepaid, um, you couldn't go after the bill of lading freight. Um, now, an owner can't intercept bill of lading freight against a third party acting in good faith, but if it's the shipper and the shipper knows they haven't paid the bill of lading freight, um, then um, the owner probably can still go after that shipper. And then a final question at the bottom there, I've put the answer in for you. Um, can the owners intercept bill of lading freight even if they are not owed money? Um, there was some discussion about this by the Court of Appeal in the bulk Chile, but it's in fact determined this year in, in a case called the SMART, um, and the court has said no. In fact, the owners can intercept bill of lading freight, even if they're not owed money. Um, so, uh, but, but something that the court said was unlikely to happen. I mean, why would the owners do that? Um, but nevertheless, they confirmed there was no, um, no limit on that right. So again, a really important uh, right uh, to a self-help remedy. So I think that takes us on to uh, a new topic which Pamela was going to look at, which is, well, they're related to lien clauses, actually, uh, CESA clauses. So, Pamela. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, what are CESA clauses? Well, in many situations, uh, a voyage charter will want to limit or terminate its obligations to owners as soon as possible. For example, where the risk in the goods um, uh, has already passed to a buyer of the goods. So, in other words, charters want to try and ensure, if at all possible, that, that any obligations to the owners are assumed by the buyers of those goods after shipment. So we'll consider how uh, and whether this can be done generally in a moment, but it's it's useful to consider this um, in the context of, of the liens that uh, Alex has just discussed. So CESA clauses are uh, essentially clauses that are concerned with the question uh, of the extent to which a charter can end or cease its liability. 
Now, an express test of provision may apply uh, upon the creation of a lien upon the cargo. And the idea in theory is that once a lien is created, the liability of the charger to the owner should coextensively cease. However, uh, in practice, the, the lien must actually be available to the ship owner when the cargo is delivered, and it must be effective because uh, it's the owner's ability to obtain payment that's the key factor in determining whether the charter's liability ceases. So you have to look at it against the background that an owner would be unwilling to agree to such a set of clause uh, unless it has an effective remedy to fall back on uh, against the party to whom any liability has been transferred. Um, and, and you can see that I've put on the, uh, uh, the slide there uh, an example of a, a lien clause where there is a set of provision um, included in there. Um, so I've discussed there a little bit about what is the idea behind them. Um, but as I say, it has to be against the background that um, it, it is actually available to an owner. So in the case of the Sino, um, the normal lien clause there was deleted and replaced by a clause which read, charter's liability shall cease as soon as the cargo is on board, owners having an absolute lien on the cargo for freight, dead freight demurrage and average. So demurrage was incurred at the discharging port in that case. So although the bill of lading duly incorporated the terms of the charter party, as Alex has discussed, and hence the lien clause, no lien was in fact exercisable because in this particular case, the receiver was the government of the country uh, of discharge. Um, and th there was in place a proclamation of emergency um, empowering the government to forbid the enforcement of such liens. So the Court of Appeal in that case upheld the original decision that the right of lien had to be enforceable and effective at the time of discharge for the charter's liability to cease. So in that case, the liability didn't cease. Um, so for another example, where an owner can show that he has in fact tried to exercise a lien at the time of discharge, but failed because it wasn't legally or practically possible to obtain payment, the charter remains liable. So although the rule is that an owner must demonstrate in some way that he was unable to obtain payment by exercising the lien, um, as, it, as opposed to it simply being commercially inconvenient or difficult, um, it, it's not actually always easy to tell the difference in practice. So in each case, you need to have a consideration of all the facts um, um, and, and the surrounding circumstances, and the courts are, are actually likely to take into account what could reasonably be expected of an owner uh, looking at all the circumstances and the interests of all the parties concerned. So the situation is often not straightforward. Um, and furthermore, and in any event, um, a charter's liability for, for dead freight or demurrage may not cease entirely in any event. Um, if you examine the wording of that lien clause on the slide, it, it's clear that there's um, uh, an express responsibility on charters for those items at loading port, um, and the cessor, in fact, only applies at the discharge port. Um, moving on, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about incorporation, which, which Alex has already touched on it in terms of uh, the freight payroll um, under a bill of lading um, uh, and, and the interception of freight. Um, a, a quick reminder about what the normal rules under English law are concerning privity of contract. And it's usually the case that it's only the parties to a contract that are bound by the rights and obligations within that contract. Um, so, for instance, in the, in the straightforward context of a voyage charter, the charter is liable to pay freight to the owner um, with whom he's contracted. Uh, however, there are a number of instances um, where the provisions of other contracts and rules, um, rules in particular, may also be relevant to the parties to a voyage charter. Um, and in particular contracts of carriage under bills of lading. Uh, as, as Alex has mentioned, um, there is the possibility of um, a, a, a lien on, on sub freights. So it's common for bills of lading to incorporate charter party terms into the bill, um, but you do need to look very closely at the words used to determine which charter party clauses are applicable to the contract um, contained in any bill of lading. And as we've seen um, in previous talks, there's often one charter um, which you may have to consider um, and, and consider which is the right charter party uh, to look at. Um, you may often find general words um, of incorporation. Um, and an example of a general 
words of incorporation that, that may appear on uh, a bill of lading are, are on the slide there. Um, that's actually the Congen Bill uh, 2016, which says that all terms and conditions, liberties and exceptions of the Charter Party stated as a relief, including the law and arbitration clause, dispute resolution clause, are herewith incorporated. Um, if there are general words, such as all terms and conditions, the effect is actually that it's only those clauses of the Charter Party which are consistent with the character of a bill of lading which are incorporated into it. Um, so Alex has already discussed the circumstances where bill of lading holder can be made liable to, to, to pay freight to the owner. Um, and that's provided, of course, that the freight clause in the Charter Party is worded in such a way to allow um, uh, everything being properly construed uh, a bill of lading holder to be held liable for freight. So that's an example of voyage charter provisions being incorporated into a bill of lading contract. Now, in, in looking at incorporation um, of other terms into a voyage charter itself, um, the inclusion of a clause paramount or, or general paramount clauses, it's sometimes called, in particular may be of some significance. Um, and there's an example of part of a clause paramount on the slide there. So to recap very briefly, um, the Hague rules and the, the later Hague Visby rules were, were brought into being um, in order to govern carriage of goods by sea under bills of lading. Now, as you may know, the rules themselves are not applicable uh, as such to charter parties. However, it's not actually unusual for parties to a charter to agree that the rules should be incorporated into the charter party. And this is usually done using um, a, a clause paramount. Or, or, or a reference to a clause paramount. Um, you can see the example there, but it's important in each case to check the exact words that are used uh, in order to consider precisely what is being incorporated. And there may be various um, different variations. It may be US uh, Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, the US COGSA, the Hague Rules, or the Hague Visby Rules. And you also need to check what part, if any, of those rules are actually being incorporated. And that's because although you may find a reference simply to clause paramount, there's actually a, a number of different formulations um, that may appear similar at first, but may produce uh, very different results once they are properly considered. Um, one point to note there is that you'll see the clause paramount refers to a bill of lading. It says this bill of lading shall have effect. Um, under English law, even though there is a reference to bill of lading, the clause paramount is um, incorporated into the charter itself. Um, and, and see the Adamastos case for a, 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 a citation for, for that particular rule. Um, and the court accepted in that case that there had to be some flexibility in construing the wording of the rules uh, in the context of a charter party um, and, and not a bill of lading. Um, so the effect of this is that it, it's seen as a wish by the parties to incorporate into their contractual relationship under the charter party um, as between owners and charters themselves, the same standards um, of obligations, liabilities, rights, immunities uh, that, that are usually found between a carrier and, and shipper under the rules. Um, not going to go into too much detail there because that's a sort of entirely separate talk by itself. Um, but it's worth noting it may be crucial in certain circumstances when considering the rights and obligations of each party under a, a voyage charter. So, in particular, Article 3, Rule 6 of the Hague Rules uh, uh, and, and the other um, similar rules has a, has a one year time limit for bringing claims in respect of goods against the carrier. Um, now, its incorporation into a voyage charter has the effect that the time bar applies to a breach of any term of the charter by the owner in respect of loss or damage. So the loss or damage referred to must be loss or damage which is related to the cargo owner's goods, but it's not actually confined to actual loss and physical damage. L loss or damage is simply in relation to the goods if it arises in relation to the loading, hand, loading handling, stowage, carriage, custody, um, care and discharge of the goods as well. Um, and, and see the Sonia for um, uh, an example of that. Um, so the question of whether or not the loss or damage has a necessary relationship to the goods is often a question of fact. And it can actually be much wider um, than appears at, at first glance. 
So a clause paramount and its precise effect, particularly as there are slight differences um, in the time bars in relation to each of the rules, um, is something that Charter needs to bear in mind at the outset in the event of any loss being incurred, because the one thing you do not want to fall foul of is, is a one year time limit uh, for, for a claim against um, an owner. Um, as I say, it's worth looking very closely at the words in each case and at the circumstances of any incident. So that, that's all we wanted to um, talk about at the moment. I think um, we've got some questions and answers we're going to look at. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Alex, I think, who's going to deal with the question first. Thank you, Pamela. Um, we have some people have pre-submitted some questions. Thank you very much. And one of them related to um, liens on sub, sub freights and how exactly it worked depending on who is owed what, which is, is a very good question. Now I'm going to flip back. So I think the, the important, it's a, it's a good question. So what, what you've got, if you remember here, is, is what I call an equitable assignment. So what, you're, what the charter is doing is assigning to the head owner a right to the money they're owed by the subcharterer. And, and similarly, the, sub, the charter is assigning, um, the subcharterer is assigning to the charterer uh, their right to hire or, or freight uh, from the sub sub charterer, um, and you can only assign. You can't you can't assign rights that are better than your own rights. So what effectively this means is that uh, you need to have a link. So there needs to be there need to be liens on sub hire or sub freight all the way up this chain um, for the head owner to succeed. And second of all, it will only be for the uh, the, the maximum amount of the lien can only be for the smallest amount that is actually uh, for, for, for the smallest amount that is owed up this chain. So let's say the head owner is owed a million dollars by the charterer, but the charterer is actually owed only a hundred thousand dollars by the subcharterer. All the charterer can assign or has been able to assign to the head owner is that right to a hundred thousand dollars. They they can't assign to the um, uh, to the head owner any bigger rights than that um, and therefore arguably therefore if you're the head owner in those circumstances your best uh, uh, recovery is going to be uh, that hundred thousand dollars not not the million that you're owed even if the party at the bottom is 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 um has a million dollars in freight for example that's got to be paid um so so these 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 um this is why it's so significant, actually, that the interception of billing, bill of lading at freight um, is, is not limited. Um, and indeed, the, the owner can intercept the whole freight, um, uh, which makes that right extremely powerful. Uh, and, and the other thing actually I was going to add on, on in relation to that uh, question was this is very similar to the uh, what this is actually a very similar um, scenario to the uh, bulk chili. Um, so in that case, um, you had the owner had chartered to Career Line, um, who chartered to Fayette, and then who chartered to MetInvest. MetInvest and Fayette are actually uh, linked companies, or they were uh, part of the same group, I believe. Um, and uh, the owners, uh, because Career Line uh, went to, had financial difficulties, uh, they then went after uh, MetInvest for a lien on sub freights, but also that interception of bill of lading freight. Um, uh, and uh, MetInvest paid by it anyway, um, and then un unfortunately had to pay the head owners as well. So it's a significant uh, right. Needs to be exercised at the correct time, um, often around the time of loading, that's when freight is normally due. If you miss that, they could be 5% freight or balance freight due at some stage later, um, but um, uh, but your big chance is when the main amount of freight is being um, paid, get in there first. So I hope that answers that question. Pam, I think you've also got one. Um, yes, I had a question about um, the meaning of, of charter party bills of lading and, and how does the incorporation of a charter party work um, into bill of lading? Are the full terms incorporated? So, as we just discussed, in order to incorporate the terms of a charter party into bill of lading, there must be words to, to that effect in the bill of lading. So you always need to examine the words of the bill carefully. Um, a simple reference to a, a charter party won't usually 
be of itself sufficient and that there must be some sort of words that indicate that incorporation is intended by the uh, parties, which, which is why the precise words used are, are important. Um, but the general rule remains that it's only those clauses of the Charter Party which are consistent with its character as a bill of lading that are incorporated into it, bearing in mind that that's a contract of, um, contract of carriage. Um, uh, one thing you do need to bear in mind in particular, actually, is that uh, when you're looking at the law and arbitration clauses in the Charter, uh, these do need to be referred to expressly um, and general words alone aren't enough to incorporate a, a, a law and arbitration or dispute resolution clause. Thanks, Pam. Uh, yeah, I, there's a question that's been submitted um, just in relation to possessory liens. Um, and so, in fact, I'll use the opportunity to go back a couple more slides. Um, I can. Here we go. Um, so the question is is about. So we've been talking about unpaid freight, but actually, it, it quite possible that the lien uh, clause, and you'd obviously have to look at your lien clause, could be for uh, freight, uh, demurrage, detention, uh, uh, and other sums that may be due. Um, and obviously, as I say, you have to look at your clause. This is a contractual right, uh, and you'd have to look at your clause to determine what those rights were. Um, the sums, I think I said on the next slide, the sums must be due. Um, so you can't exercise a lien for sums that will be due in the future. So if demurrage is payable in, in 30 days after discharge, then clearly the demurrage is, is not due at the time that you're exercising the lien. Therefore, uh, you know, as I say, unless the clause has some very, very wide wording, you won't be able to exercise a lien for that future sum. Um, there is a debate as to whether um, clauses um, include the, the alien could include a damages claim um, and a bit of bit of debate over that. Um, I think the view is that it might, but it almost certainly includes things that are definite freight detention, potentially uh, liquidated damages, so fixed amounts of damages, but less clear about. Um, uh, unliquidated damages claims. So in theory, um, if your bill of lading has terms of incorporation, um, incorporating the terms of the voyage charter, it would include the whole voyage charter lien clause. And therefore, in theory, a head owner could exercise their lien against the receiver um, for uh, all of the sums that they're entitled to exercise the lien under, under the voyage charter. Um, so, but as I said, um, that's not where the story ends because uh, a lot will depend on how that would then be exercised in the local jurisdiction. Um, there was actually another, whilst we're on the subject, a pre-submitted question in relation to um, who pays whilst all of this is going on. Now, um, if a lien is exercised and the vessel is delayed, um, then hire and or um, uh, demurrage um, or detention um, would arguably continue to accrue um, between the head owner and the charterer uh, and potentially uh, if that's all included in the bill of in the um, uh, lien clause it would continue to accrue on in the lien as well um, there is um, there is a, a case called the agnusiotis which suggests that even if there is no lien in the bill of lading. Um, the fact that the charterer gave a lien to the head owner and should have made sure there was a lien available to the head owner um, means that, the, that even if the lien is arguably invalid against the receiver, the charterer should still pay um, for the delay whilst all this is being uh, worked out. So, um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, and uh, I just want to say, well, that brings this webinar to an end, this series of webinars to an end. Um, but we have cargo claims coming in the new year. Um, and otherwise, I wish you and your families and your friends uh, a, a very enjoyable festive season and a happy new year and Christmas. And um, I hope um, that in the world we're living in, you and your families and friends stay safe and well. Thank you very much. Thank you.